Is Somalia on the brink of collapse? For decades, the fragile nation has been plagued with problems on multiple fronts. From conflict with the militant group Al-Shabaab to climate change to food and water crises, the country has been caught in what seems to be an endless cycle of devastation. Current President Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud, who was also Somalia's president from 2012 to 2017, has said that he's committed to rebuilding the nation. But what does this mean for a country that's still burdened with conflict and humanitarian issues? And with a looming famine, can the president bring about some form of stability? I'll ask President Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud himself in an upfront special. President Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud, thank you so much for joining us on Upfront. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, Somalia uh, is in crisis. Uh, El Shabaab has continued its deadly attacks. The country is facing its worst drought uh, in 40 years, and close to half of the country's population, more than 7 million people, uh, faces acute hunger. The numbers show that the current crisis could surpass the famine of uh, 2011, which saw more than a quarter of a million people die of starvation. You still haven't declared a famine yet officially. Uh, that would allow humanitarian aid to flow in uh, to the country. Why? First of all, yes, you rightly express that Somalia has multiple crises. Please, that's true. Regarding the drought, there are uh, very serious drought. Now we have the fifth victim. But with the effort of the Somali government and with the support of the international community, right now I can say temporarily we averted the famine. There is no famine right now. But still that uh, risk is looming. I, I, I'm not claiming that Somalia is free from the risk of having famine. Yeah. But with the generosity of the international community and with the support of Somali people, right now we averted that famine, but it's still the challenge is ahead and it's there. I mean, you say looming. Uh, we're in the winter now. I mean, within a few months, we could be seeing a famine, a full-fledged famine, no? No, I don't believe so. On the reality in the ground right now, the amount of food available in the, in the country, the amount of food distributed throughout, there is no immediate famine or crisis or risk right now or in the next one month or two months even. There were some who estimated that your initial reason, your initial reluctance to declaring a famine was less about knowing that it could be averted and more about not wanting to redirect funds that would have otherwise been directed toward uh, long-term development projects. What, what do you say to that? As a president of Somalia, recently elected, on the six months I'm in the office, the first thing that I did was appointing a special envoy for the drought victims to get the support and raise the awareness of the international community and the donors how the situation is. And that's what made that Somalia has got a lot of support from the outside world. And that's what I'm saying, that we averted the immediate famine right now. That's number one. Number two, I want to tell you that in my office, where I have only three priorities right now. One is the war against the terror. The second is the humanitarian issue. And the third is the uh, debt relief uh, completion point of the HEBIC. So for us, the humanitarian aspect is a top, top priority in Somalia. And uh, we're doing a lot of work on that by mobilizing the local resources as well as the international resources. And that's what averted the famine that these people were predicting. These people were predicting months ago that famine will take place in Somalia. And right I mean, all the indicators were certainly there. And, and you're saying that you averted it because of support. What kind of support? Talk to me a little bit more about the type of support you, you, you've received. In a situation like that, there was an urgent and emergency, emergency supplies, urgent supplies. We, I appointed a special envoy. We established a Somali disaster management agency that's in charge of that. And then the important supplies that we're receiving is number one, food, and number two is money to raise those food items that saves the life. And all the life-saving apparatus is in place. I'm not denying that there is a risk of famine in the future, but right now the risk is not there. Uh, Somalia has been labeled as uh, a fragile state. Yes. Uh, and that's not just now. That's really been on and off uh, since President Siad Barre's military government was overthrown in 1991, which, of course, led to state collapse, frankly, some of the worst years in your country's history. Today, the country appears at the top of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's Fragility Framework. Um, your state is classified as extremely fragile. Given the situation on the ground right now, uh, 
is Somalia in danger of collapsing again? Well, uh, first of all, uh, being a fragile state, is not specific for Somalia. There are many countries. Somalia has struggled and went through a long way to come up or to come out of the failed state that it was for a long time. And now we are in a fragile state. And we are moving forward tomorrow that we are going to get out of it. What is going right now, like uh, the debt relief progress that we made, and we are going out of the habit process uh, in the coming months or so, by having established all the political stability that transfers the power peacefully from one system, from one term to another, to another, not one time, two times, three times. So these are indicators that Somalia is moving out of fragility. Well, I mean, to be clear, the, the, the move from fail to fragile is more about a change in language than an actual improvement, just in terms of the framework itself, just for the audience's benefit. They've simply changed the language that they use. Uh, but the idea that you're still so high up, despite certainly some improvements, has many people concerned. Uh, you've talked about some of the things you're doing to stave off complete state failure. Uh, talk to me a little bit more, though, about the type of uh, economic and security moves you have to make. There's a genuine concern, and, a, and I think a reasonable one, a well-founded one, uh, that you're still on the verge. Look, we went through a civil war. Clan is fighting against clan groups, factions against factions. We went all through this, but we are out of now. Now the only conflict we had is with the terrorist groups. Yes, a society and everywhere, there are local level conflicts here and there, but not uh, killing a lot of people or dying a lot of people. A violent conflict now in Somalia is the extremist groups violence. So let's talk about them, because you uh, declared total war yes. on al-Shabaab. Mm -hmm. And you've been very clear and unequivocal about that, of course. That's the al-Qaeda link group. Uh, they currently control 20 percent of the country. They also have a functioning shadow government, and they have not ceased their recruitment. Your country's instability, both economically and socially, is really linked and it's cited as one of the motivating factors for uh, many people joining the group. So help me understand how you will address the root causes that allow an as shabab to exist in the first place? Well, my dear friend, uh, the way, I, again, I have said, you're talking about uh, yesterday. We are not talking about today. Today, Somalia, the main discussion going on is post al shabab Well, before we get to post al shabab they're just, actively just, recruiting just, now, though. Just, but, but, but I want to make sure, because my concern is that we'll be fighting a forever war. No, no, if, just a minute. When we said a total war, we have new approaches introduced now against the war al shabab and we are showing all the indicators that we are succeeding, and Shabab is going to end. Why Shabab existed first time in the history? That's a long history. That's a state failure. That was the Shabab. Everywhere, all over the world, wherever you see there is a terrorist group flourishes. That's where the state is not existing or is weak or fragile, whatever you say. So Mari want a time where there was no state at all. That it was a breeding ground for these people. They call it over the world fair, and they started there. Yes, but what, what, there are people who are just... But how do, but, but just I, I, I want to push you on that, no, Mr. No, President. No, no, how, no, no. how do, how do we know to, that that's no, not the, the case route, now? The route you said, the route you said is, mm. there are people who are in the terrorist group for ideological reason. There are people there for economic reason. There are people there for having grievances, uh, other grievances, social uh, clan systems and all this. Absolutely. There are these groups to get together, but the core group is the ideological group that has made all this work together. Somalia now is a position that we have the f you cannot have a reconciliation without functioning state institutions. We're starting now to have the function institutions. Somalia is in agreement with politically. We have the platform to make the political reconciliation. Hmm. And this is going on right now. It is I, absolutely. I don't doubt that you've laid this platform out, and you've, you've been very articulate about what the platform is, particularly at the ideological and the economic levels. Uh, might it not be an overstatement, though, to say that you're winning the war? They still control 20 percent of the country. They're still actively recruiting. I yes. understand your, your plan may be successful ultimately, but at this moment... They are not actively recruiting now. And you said they control 20 percent of the country. They were controlling 80 percent of the country. Today, you know, Shabab cannot move in freely in everywhere. We cut all the lines that they were supplying among them. And so what the, areas do they no longer control? Four, four states. They were, we have five states and Somaliland, the Somaliland. Four states of the current Federal Republic of Somalia was 
80% controlled by Al-Shabaab. Now they are almost two states are almost going to be free from Al-Shabaab in weeks' time. The other two states are serious preparations which will go on. So this is the reality today in the ground. Two major federal member states are going to be free from Al-Shabaab in weeks' time. You also asked the United States, which has redeployed a small uh, number of troops to the country, to loosen restrictions on drone strikes. The use of drones, of course, isn't new, but the use of drone strikes remains very controversial. Targets are often difficult to discern. Civilians are frequently killed during attacks. That's according to many organizations, including Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. But why would your government call for more drone strikes that could very likely kill innocent civilians? Well, uh, experience always has a learning curve. Yes, it happened, those strikes in the past. In some parts of Somalia, there were civilian victims that happened. That as we started the current campaign now, there is no any collateral side or side effect that, or any civilian effect. Based it on the experience and the restrictions, the drone, the drone, the operating the drone is not a free freelance that everybody can do whatever he wants. Restrictions and procedures that are in place, and we have participated. What, what are those procedures? Because when we look at drone strikes in Afghanistan, in uh, Pakistan, in Somalia, in Yemen, uh, just about anywhere we see drone strikes, we see civilian. Casualties. That, that seems to be an unavoidable how, part of how, technology. How many drone strikes were successful without having civilian casualties? You know, the kind of war we are in, I'm not claiming and I'm saying that will not take place, but we are doing all the necessary precautions what? to avoid, to avoid what? that. It is not necessary what, 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 to, to publicly say it here, but we are doing all the necessary precautions to avoid uh, civilian casualties. And the, for the last six months that this operation is going on, we succeeded that. We don't have civilian casualties as now. Well, well, we'll have to we'll have to see the investigations on that to make sure that that's the case. That again, it seems hard to believe. But you've actually called to loosen restrictions. So you're saying that you're doing all you can to make sure that there are no civilian casualties. At the very same time that you're calling to loosen restrictions on mm -hmm. on drone strikes, the restrictions are the very thing mm -hmm. that limit civilian ca civilian casualties. No, and th restrictions are too many. It's not the, we are not losing those restrictions that protect the civilian casualties. There are other military well, well, restrictions. Specifically, which ones? I'm not going to discuss it in public, please. Y you've called to loosen restrictions. You've publicly called for the I'm loosening of restrictions. I'm saying we are not losing the restrictions that risk the life of civilians, period. I understand that point. Yes. I'm now asking a second Don't question. Don't ask me the military restrictions, please. But, but you're, you've publicly called for these restrictions to be loosened. What, yes. what are you calling for? The restrictions are not the restrictions that affect the civilian casualties. So these restrictions that you've publicly called for are private and, and military, military secrets? Military, yes. It's a military restrictions re related on the military operations, not restrictions that affect the civilian, the civilian security, no. Hmm. So you've publicly called for restrictions that you can't publicly explain what they are? Yes, I insist. Okay. Let's talk about the past decade. Your government and international partners have, have funded Klan militias uh, in the fight against al-Shabaab to get to that post-Shabaab world you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are multiple reports of the group, the groups uh, instead killing, uh, raping, torturing uh, civilians Ooh. in their own communities and Ooh. beyond uh, as this, th Ooh. these Klan militias. I don't have those reports. I'm the president oh. and I don't have it. Wow. Uh, the U.S. Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, uh, I'll give you an example of, of Klan militia rape. On May 14th, 2021, five members of a Klan militia was, raped three was... women and attempted to rape two others. The militia members were allegedly wearing SPF, Somali police force uniforms, and working uh, with Mogadishu's denial district administration. Uh, we've seen reports of gender-based violence. We've seen militia and torture. There's a report here that says... Uh, Torture and other cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment or punishment at the hands of Klan militias, some of which are government-affiliated, remain frequent in 2021. We've also seen reports of Klan militias uh, beheading al-Shabaab fighters. So if we see beheadings, if we see uh, militias and torture, rape, mm -hmm. and hope, I, I hope that friend, you, know, you get these reports, my friend, uh, which are readily available, how do you hold them accountable? First of all, how do you explain that? My friend, in 2021, I was not in charge of Somalia. I would have liked you to ask me what I am responsible I am in charge of it. Mistakes happen in the past, and every Shabaab attack, everywhere they are, either they have the military uniform 
or the police uniform, and these are available in the market. So I would have liked you, let us discuss the Somali of today. Well, in, in the, Somali, that, of to, in the that, Somali of today, how will you hold those Klan militias accountable for what they've been doing consistently for the last 10 years? And, don't, and there seems to be no evidence that they've stopped. No, it's all about how you approach the Klan militias and where they operate and how they operate. So how do you approach them? This is the Klan militia. They are operating in their own Klan territory. And the Klan militias, they don't rape their own people. When there is a clan, the fight, reports are that they are. No. The reports are that they're doing these, that they're they're working in their own communities and beyond. And that's not true. I deny that, and I would have liked further proofs to come up. Well, again, in you said you haven't seen these reports, but I'd like you to look at these reports from the U.S. Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. I think they will they, you will be able to see that. Also, the United Nations mission uh, in Somalia, the UN Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, they talk about all of these things, and the reports are contradicting what you're saying. And I understand you said you haven't seen the reports, but I, I, I think you should, Mr. President, because these are urgent issues. And if you're going to address them, you, you, you say it's how you approach you them. Are keeping me, you are keeping me with the, the, the vicious circle of the Somalis' difficult times in the past. We are moving forward. This does not mean that it will remain today as it was 2020 or even a decade ago. Somalia is moving, it's progressing. We don't have such incidents right now. And we're walking. I will we, not, well, I will well, not well, say. Well, we don't I know if that's true, say, but how, but how no, do you hold them accountable? How, how, no. To move forward, we need accountability. We need justice. How do you hold those groups accountable for these actions? There was always systems that makes them accountable. Those systems were weak. We're strengthening those systems, whether they are traditional or religious or illegal. We are strengthening so, all the systems in place. Can you, can you give me more detail about that? Because the, what are these systems that are being strengthened, and how are you strengthening them? Mobilizing. Awareness raising, it's not, it's not the switch that... But aware, awareness not. raising doesn't stop rape. Awareness raising doesn't stop beheadings of Al-Shabaab fighters. It stops. How? It, it contributes. The rule of law stops this thing. But where there is no rule of law, what are we going to do? That's the awareness Okay, so, so rule of law. So are we saying you're prosecuting these people? Are we, are, are we arresting yes. people? What, yes. You, right. have, you, have you begun doing that? Right now, there are people who are in the custody of the security forces and in the process of judiciary. There is a special case that I would like to mention here. In the city of Johar, the capital city of Irshabella, there was a man who raped a woman and who killed. The security service have been after him for a couple of months. They, they, they took him. He's in custody and he's in the court of law right now. Mm -hmm. And in the coming days or weeks, there will be a judgment against him. So that's one example only. But the, the security forces, the rule of law apartheid are going after every single case that happened right now. There are clans who, there are people who make uh, illegal checkpoints in the street and who looted some people. They have been taken under the custody and they are going in the process of the rule, in the process of the courts right now. Talk to me, talk to me about refugees. Uh, more than 80,000 people have fled Somalia and uh, arrived in Kenya's uh, Dadaab refugee camps over the past two years, escaping conflict uh, and drought. Uh, but resources are severely strained uh, at these camps, as you well know. These camps house more than 200,000 refugees yes. uh, and asylum seekers. Uh, those in Dadaab are facing overcrowded living conditions. Uh, there's a cholera outbreak there right now. Uh, what kind of uh, cooperation have you set up with the Kenyan government uh, to support Somali citizens there? Well, uh, this is a, a very, very painful reality. Our people are there, not only one now, but generations are in the refugee camps now. People who are born there are now kids, have got kids, and so on. So it's a very painful reality that's there. And the only way out is solving the problem, the security problem of Somalia. Once that solve it, then people will come back. Of course, there are number, some parts of these people, they are for economic reasons. They are refugees, economic refugees. They are not all security refugees. But we are working with the government of Kenya. I visited Kenya twice since the elected new president. One of the subjects that we were discussing is the refugee. We really appreciate and sympathize the difficulties that Kenya is facing because of these refugees. And it has been a very long time. We're willing to take back our people. And that's why, but we cannot take back right now. But that's why we are going to make Somalia free from Al-Shabaab, Somalia, that the rule of law is upheld, and Somalia, that all the challenges that existing is gradually improved. Mm -hmm. So we are envisioning that those refugees will come back, and we are discussing right now. Do you have an imagined timetable for that? 
first of all, you know, refugees, they have to come back voluntarily. Of course. And by coming back voluntarily, they have to be convinced and believe that going back is a better place than the refugee. Because the refugee comes, they are getting some services. They have to get those services. They have to get the assurance of security. So even psychologically, to convince those people would take time. So taking time frame for that, but within two years, we are expecting that the returnees of the refugee will start. Mm. It will take a couple of years for all of them to come back. They may not come back, all of them. But after two years, what we are expecting and planning is that they will start coming back. You stated recently that you want uh, Somalia to be an inclusive and uh, progressive society. Uh, you mentioned wanting strong democratic uh, processes. You want accountability. You want transparency uh, in the government. Uh, but a key component of any society like that is a free press. In October, veteran Somali journalist Abdullah Ahmed Mutman raised concerns about a new government directive prohibiting, quote, dissemination of extremism ideology messages, fearing that it could uh, tacitly restrict free speech. Uh, Mutman, who is secretary general of the Somali Journalist Syndicate, was arrested. Journalists in Somalia are often under threat when they criticize al-Shabaab. They're under threat when they criticize the government. Uh, how will you address these kinds of issues if you're going to create the kind of progressive and inclusive Somalia that you've articulated? Well, uh, freedom of expression is a... a, a uh, fundamental principle for our uh, uh, political thought and uh, uh, democratic establishment that we want to put in place. Yes, the fight against Al-Shabaab may take some uh, astray, some, some people from our us, but what we are talking about is propagating Al-Shabaab agenda and propagating false information, misinformation regarding al-Shabaab. That's what we have been talking about, but not a freedom of expression and not a free speech. It is not a free but speech. But Abdullah it's Ahmed Mutman was, was arrested, quote, for publicly disobeying a government directive and holding a press conference that criticized the directive. Well, that is, a, the directive is a law and it's a legal framework. It will, no one... What was the directive? No one... Not propagating al-Shabaab's ideology. That was mainly focused. How, how, how did he publicly propagate uh, if, al-Shabaab's ideology? If, if, he, if he objected and rejected the directive, what does it mean? Wait, but you're saying the directive is, is, is prom you can't promote al-Shabaab. Yes. How did he do that? He refused the directive. As you rightly said now, he objected the directive. If he objected the directive, that means well, he's taking free hand to propagate the idea of al-Shabaab. Or, 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 or he's and he, challenging the idea of, of, of a government restricting free speech. No, that's the difference. The directive is not restriction of, the, of free speech. Hmm. The directive was not intended at all. And there are laws that protect the free speech. This directive was not against those laws. He, he has suffered violations of his human rights, uh, according to many organizations, including the, the Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, including arbitrary arrest and detention, denial of fair trial yeah. rights, and restrict, restriction if, of his if, right to freedom of expression. He says he still faces threat and persecution from Somali authorities. If, How do you respond to that? If, they, if these are there, these claims are there, we have courts and we have rule of law systems. They have to go through the court system and go. Everybody can be, no one is above the law. And we have a judiciary system that functions. Let them go to the judiciary system. You, you've talked a lot about the post uh, al-Shabaab Somalia. Uh, what's your vision for the country? This is the one you've been talking recently. Democratic Somalia that upholds all the democratic principles that are applicable to our country and our society and our faith. And the Somalia that is free from violence, the Somalia that serves self-sufficiency in many aspects. Democratic Somalia, which upholds the constitutionality. Yes, still we are in the building of that society, but that's the vision. Mr. President, thank you so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. That is our show, Upfront. We'll be back next week.